Today we're going to talk about pain control and sickle cell disease. A common problem dealt with often in control and treatment of these kids. Pain control is a common problem because the pain crises that sicklers get is very common. A couple of things you need to remember is that these can arise anywhere in the body, but pain in the back, legs, or chest are common areas of concern. Chest pain differential diagnosis always has to include pneumonia and acute chest syndrome, and nobody will ever fault you for ordering a chest x-ray to rule out either one of those, especially in a kid whose O2 sats are borderline. And remember, 93 is the low end of normal. Below that, they've got to be worked out. Other common differential diagnoses, pain, pain crisis versus osteomyelitis, usually the only separating symptom between the two is osteomyelitis is more commonly associated with a high fever. Pain crisis versus abdominal infection or obstruction, such as appendicitis or, or other uh, causes of bowel obstruction, are another common concern and weigh heavily on the treating physician. No one is ever going to fault you for obtaining imaging studies to try to rule that out one way or the other. No one is ever going to assault or be concerned about a surgical consult on one of these kids either because the differential diagnosis is very critical. All right. As you know, we treat these kids with fluids and analgesia, and our fluid goals are to expand the vascular space, to break open those clumps of sickle cell, to hydrate and help the body get rid of the hemolyzed debris from all those cells. But we also want to avoid overhydration, as overhydration turns into pulmonary edema even at low levels, and this increases your risk for acute chest syndrome, which is a common cause of death in both kids and adults. The fluid therapy then approached is normal saline bolus in the ER and clinic, usually 10 to 20 mLs per kilo, and then you see how that responds. If they are going to become admitted to the hospital or you're planning on keeping them for a while in the clinic, one and a half to two times maintenance IV fluid with standard fluids um, is usually the approach we take. We'll turn the fluids down after 24 to 48 hours just to avoid that risk of overhydration. The analgesia goals are to rapidly break the pain. You want to create an environment where the kids know that when they come to the doctor they're going to get better and so they come to the doctor quickly. You want to avoid over narcotizing the patient as it depresses respirations. We both know that it can depress the respiratory rate but it also can depress the respiratory depth and that decrease in depth of respiration can cause regional um, atelectasis and that regional atelectasis causes regional hypoxia which causes sickling in the lung and acute chest syndrome. So what we normally try to use is a morphine and toradol bolus in the ER clinic to help us determine whether or not the patient's really going to have to come to the hospital or not. Then we'll use morphine using a PCA pump as soon as a child's old enough to rely on that. Prior to that age, we'll generally use either bolus morphine or a continuous infusion morphine. We try to minimize the dose of morphine using a PCA, which has been very effective in doing so. In addition, we'll have the kids use incentive spirometry and, and scheduled ambulation to keep them from having atelectasis. We'll also use uh, non steroidals such as Toradol or ibuprofen as adjuvants to the narcotic. The third goal is to avoid long term dependence and secondary gain. We want these kids not to become addicted or more, more importantly not to become dependent on the narcotic or, or tolerant of the narcotic so that we don't end up having to use more and more and more and develop problems of high dose narcotic therapy. So our treatment is to get these kids broken and then out of the hospital as quick as possible. We want them onto oral drugs as soon as practical. In addition, when you're dealing with a child 
consult educational support on every one of these kids that gets admitted. We need to have them stay in school and stay current with school. Otherwise, they fall behind and that causes them long-term problems that we want to avoid. So we use a pain ladder. Pain ladder is similar to that we, we use for our oncology patients. We start with a combination of non-steroidals, commonly Tylenol and ibuprofen. Tylenol and ibuprofen actually works as well as Tylenol codeine in many studies. And Tylenol codeine, though, is used in some patients who respond to it better than plain Tylenol. We'll then use an ibuprofen plus Tylenol with codeine as step two. And then as step three, we'll use a bolus of narcotic along with the Toradol. Step three is a great step to use if you're not sure where the patient's heading and you can give them a dose of morphine, come back in an hour. If their morphine uh, dose has broken their pain, then likely they can go home and be treated outpatient. If the morphine has barely changed the pain level, then you know you're going to have to put them in the hospital and you can move forward in that plan. Step four is morphine uh, PCA and non steroidal, such as scheduled Tordal and then a low dose PCA. So factors about perceived pain that you can control are the drug you give, and the type and the amount, the speed at which it's given after it's requested, and the speed at which treatment strategy changes are made. In other words, you can control what you give, you can control how fast it's given, and you can control when you make your mind up when you need to change. Factors you can't control are their previous experience with pain their drug tolerance coming to you, the formulary limitations of the hospital you're working in, and their state of illness. Have they progressed to the point where their pain is um, intolerable? Have they uh, actually got a bone infarction instead of a, just a simple pain crisis? It's important to remember that the speed at which a drug is given reflects on the anxiety that people get from pain. Pain creates an anxiety. The anxiety aggravates future pain and causes the need for more drug. And so by rapidly treating the initial pain and successfully treating initial pain, you can break that anxiety formation and thus deal only with pain uh, later on the hospitalization. The speed at which stra treatment strategy changes are made is very important. If you have somebody on bolus morphine and it's not working, there's no point in waiting until the next day to make the change to a PCA or continuous infusion morphine. Simply do it and do it quickly so that your strategy can be tested and further changes if needed can be made um, promptly. So some basic things about pain management. Narcotics should be titrated to the amount needed to control pain and no more. We really want to avoid writing P PRN drugs for more than one dose. If you're in a clinic or an ER and you're trying to figure out whether someone needs to come in the hospital, go ahead and give them that one dose and then see if it's changed. If it has, then you've got an answer. If it hasn't, then you also have an answer. But don't use a PRN for in-hospital management because this creates more of that delay in getting therapy when my pain flares up and then creates the anxiety that we have a problem with later on. Rely on adjuvants that are non-additive in terms of side effects. Valium and morphine are both adjuvants to each other, but they both aggravate each other's side effect profile. Tordal or ibuprofen is not an additive uh, drug in terms of side effects to morphine, but it is very good, both are very good for uh, being adjuvants in terms of pain control. <clears throat> so PCA versus continuous infusion. If you look at this study, there were uh, patients with sickle cell who had um, pain scores, and their patients who were on continuous infusion versus PCA and you'll note that they had similar declines in pain. They had 
a similar uh, perceived pain control and their quality of life was similar in terms of response. So we have a child who can have a continuous infusion or a PCA. PCA will use less drug, have less side effects, and get adequate pain control compared to continuous infusion. They also get out of the hospital quicker. So additional data on that morphine uh, consumption. If you look at the total morphine dose per hour, it's obviously quite a bit smaller, 0.5 for the PCA group and 2.4 for the morphine group. The total amount of morphine was tremendously larger for the total continuous infusion group. The mean pain score was comparable. Side effects were also comparable, although a trend towards less nausea and less constipation was noted. If you look at high dose versus low dose PCA, patients who are on a high dose uh, morphine uh, here getting 70 hours, 70 milligrams, excuse me, of morphine in the first day and 65 in the second day had less, had, uh, less pain control than a group getting lower dose strategy uh, with a total of only 56 and 58 milligrams per day. Their total dose was uh, smaller and their total days on narcotic was smaller. Their total number of hospital days was markedly smaller with a statistically significant p-value. So we use a PCA and we use a low, do low basal rate strategy in which about one-third of the total morphine is used as basal and then two-thirds of that total morphine dose is divided into the PCA. Using a quick interval for the lockout is preferable to a long interval for lockout. So 10 minutes would be optimal, although 15 minutes is also acceptable. Longer than 20 minutes is, is not usually helpful. So summary, patients with a high fever and pain think infection, pneumonia or osteo, depending on the location, or think infarction, bone infarction or acute chest syndrome. Don't bite for just a pain crisis. Your goal is to break the pain fast and get them back to school. Your goal is to avoid overdoing fluids and narcotics to avoid adding to their risk of acute chest syndrome, which, as you know, is a significant uh, cause